Good afternoon, everybody, and let me add my welcome to NSS Week and to Carlisle Barracks and to the great state of Pennsylvania, my home state. Um, I'm going to give this lecture today. They've asked me to also let you know that this is going to be put on the Army War College's YouTube channel in case you don't get enough of it once and you want to see it again, you have that option. Um, what I want to talk about is America's entry into the First World War in 1917, uh, which happened just over 100 years ago this month. And it's a subject that we as a community of historians, I think, have treated particularly badly. There's not a lot of research on it. What does exist is mostly focused on Woodrow Wilson, who, as I hope to show you here, is really not all that relevant to the story. And the tale that I like to tell folks, my daughter came home a couple of years ago with a homework she had to do for high school, asking what event led to America entering the First World War. And she was so excited that she was studying something that I was interested in. And she came to me and said, Dad, what do I circle? And I said, well, they're all wrong, but circle C, because that's the one your teacher wants. Um, <laughs> Which confuses a 10th grader, but for the record. Um, C was, of course, the sinking of the Lusitania, which occurred in May of 1915, which almost by definition, therefore, can't be a proximate cause of something that happens two years later. Now, as I hope to show you here, the Lusitania is important, but not because it led the United States into the First World War. What I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a journey, and the man that I want to use for this is a North Carolina newspaperman named Walter Hines Page, who became Woodrow Wilson's ambassador to Great Britain in 1914. Now, Page had no background in diplomacy. He had absolutely no background in foreign affairs. He went there because he had been one of the earliest supporters of Wilson in a critical state, North Carolina. When the war broke out in August of 1914, Walter Hines Page wrote a letter to Woodrow Wilson that ended like this. Now and ever, I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean. Thank God we are out of it. In other words, this is none of our concern. It doesn't affect us in any way. We're going to help the people who are disadvantaged by this war. Walter Heinz Page is pro-British and pro-French when the war begins in his mindset. That is, he wants Britain and France to win the war, but it's not our fight. Just over a year later, he wrote another letter to Wilson in which he said, if Germany wins, the Monroe Doctrine will be shot through. We shall have to have a great army and navy. And I always pause here to remind folks he meant this negatively. He meant that the United States, which had paid almost nothing for its army and navy, had had its security on the cheap, was now going to have to invest in a conscript army like the German and a modern navy like the British. And he thought that was bad. In another letter written about this same time, he said, we're going to have to make a choice to build one battleship or one university per month. And it was quite clear he preferred the university. But suppose that England wins. We shall then have merely an academic dispute with her it is a matter of life or death for English-speaking civilization. And what I was really interested in in putting the book together that this talk is based on is how the United States went for now and ever, I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean, thank God we're out of it, to now it's a matter of life and death. What's happened in those 14, 15 months? Now, I could have picked a lot of people that went through this similar arc. Walter Hines Page, to me, is the most interesting, both because of how vehement he is about this how early he is in this process, and what he did next. He left London, came to the United States, hoping to get some time with Woodrow Wilson to convince him that this war would eventually drag the United States in, and that he, as president, better start doing something about it. He got to the White House to find out that Wilson was doing everything he could to avoid him, wouldn't meet with him. So Walter Hines Page went down to Shadow Lawn, which was Wilson's residence on the Jersey Shore. It's no longer there, uh, near Long Beach Island, uh, New Jersey and literally sat on the president's front porch until Wilson showed up. That's how convinced Page was that something was going on here. So what I want to do is kind of take you through that arc and then carry it a little bit further. Now, the first thing I want to do is dispel a couple of myths, the most important of which is the idea that still pops up in American history textbooks now and again, that the American people were just ignoring the First World War, just weren't paying any attention to it. When the First World War broke out in July, August of 1914, European governments started selling their securities, started selling the stocks that they owned in American companies, converting that money dollar for dollar into gold, which was legal in 1914, and then trying to get that gold back to Europe. The United States government, recognizing that if that continued, the US would quite literally run out of gold, took the extraordinary step of ordering the New York Stock Exchange, the Chicago Stock Exchange, and the Philadelphia Stock Exchange all to be closed and they stayed closed until after Thanksgiving 1914. You can imagine what that did to Americans, even those that don't own stocks, what a shock that was. 
And you can also see this by taking just a simple look at American newspapers, which are covering the First World War, covering the events in Europe constantly. You're going to see a lot of things here from Pittsburgh, both because that's where I'm from and because, well, that's the only reason, really. Um, this is an ad from the Pittsburgh Gazette Times, a newspaper that no longer exists. It's now part of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I guess it does exist. Advertising that they had signed on with the New York Sun to get the war reports of Richard Harding Davis, who was then the most famous of the American war correspondents, somebody everybody in America would have known, a good friend of Theodore Roosevelt's. He's actually at San Juan Hill with Theodore Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War. He covered the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. And when this war breaks out, he went to New York City. He got on the first boat he could book passage on. It turns out to be the Lusitania to get to Europe as quickly as he possibly can. And here is the Pittsburgh Gazette Times telling its readers, we have Richard Harding Davis. It's also the case that very early on in the war, most Americans are sympathetic to the British and the French. And there are plenty of reasons for that that we can talk about. Very few Americans want to do anything about it, but their sympathies are clearly pro-British and pro-French. And that's going to continue. And I'll show you a little bit of why uh, that is so important as this goes on. This is even true among many communities that are pro-German, that are German, excuse me, or are Irish. And we'll I'll talk a little bit more about this as things go on. But from the beginning, there's a clear, distinctive, measurable, obvious sympathy with the two democracies of Britain and France against the militarist societies of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Russia here is a little bit of a difficult exception because Russia is one of the allies, but it too is militarist and autocratic. So that's a little bit of a complicating factor. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, America's entry into the war comes shortly after the Russian Revolution that takes the Tsar out of the picture. It's that event that allows Woodrow Wilson to make the claim that this is a war to make the world safe for democracy. He can't use those words until the Tsar is deposed. And I want to tell you a story about another Pittsburgh person. She's from Sewickley, Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh. This is Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Uh, in her day, she was known for writing mysteries like this one, The Circular Staircase, probably her best known book. Um, as a good historian, I read it. It's not very good. She was also a muckraking progressive political reporter and very, very, very well known in her day. The story goes, in, as soon as the war had broken out, right about September of 1914, the Saturday Evening Post invited her to come to New York City for a big dinner. And the editor surprised her by saying, I have arranged for you to go to the great capitals of Europe to meet the president and his wife in Paris, the Kaiser and his wife in Germany, the emperor and his wife in Vienna, and the king and queen in London. I've also arranged for you, Mary Roberts Reinhardt, to be the first female correspondent allowed into the trenches. And I'll pay you $1,000 per dispatch if you'll do it which is an enormous sum of money. It's not bad even today for a journalist to get. The story goes that her husband stood up and said, my wife isn't going, I forbid it. And Mary Roberts Reinhardt then stood up, looked her husband right in the eye, and said, the greatest thing in the history of my life is not going by without me being a part of it. Then the husband said to the editor of the Saturday Evening Post, give me a $10,000 insurance policy on her life, and I'll let her go. <laughs> Be that as it may. Be that as it may. Mary Roberts Reinhardt went to Europe in the fall and early spring of 1914 and 1915, and the things that she saw and the things that she did are really important in the dispatches that she wrote back to Europe. And what I want to do is cover really four themes in her writing that are important. And again, she comes back just before the sinking of the Lusitania, just literally weeks before. First, she wrote in the Saturday Evening Post, as did Richard Harding Davis and many other of the great reporters, that they were going to go to Europe and condemn both sides, that this war was an idiocy perpetuated by everybody. Nevertheless, the more Mary Roberts Reinhardt was there, the more Richard Harding Davis was there, the more they started writing about how the Allies were, in fact, in the right, that France was in the war for the most just reason of all, another army had crossed its border, that Britain was in the war to defend the international rule of law, to defend the borders of Belgium, to defend the principles that the international system was built upon. The second thing she argued is that the British media was nevertheless lying to the American people. They were telling atrocity tales that weren't true. They were trying to inflate the bad things that the Germans were doing. So she said, as did Richard Harding Davis, don't believe them. Believe what we Americans have seen with our own eyes. Richard Harding Davis was in the Belgian University city of Louvain when the Germans burned it. They locked him in a railway car 
to try to prevent him from seeing what was going on. Nevertheless, he manages to kind of push the boards apart and pierce through and whatever and can see what's happening. Then they release him and he can walk through the town. He can talk to German officers who say, yeah, we torched this town to teach these Belgians a lesson. Notice we didn't touch the American consulate. See, we're okay, we're good, right? American reporters are telling Americans what we've seen, what we can prove is bad enough. Don't believe the British atrocity stories. Third, she argued that if the United States had to get involved in the war, Americans should fight for American goals. The United States should, under no circumstances, be tricked into fighting this war merely to rescue the British and the French from their own mistakes. If, however, this war were to affect American interests, the United States should fight it. And fourth, she argued, again, this is right before the Lusitania, America should start thinking about this problem now. It is not a good idea to wait and hope that, as she described it, the fire in your neighbor's house won't reach your roof. It's time to start thinking about this now. And those are themes from Mary Roberts Reinhardt. There are also themes from Richard Harding Davis, a bunch of others. There were even a couple of American war correspondents who tried to sign up and join the French army while they were over there, only to be talked out of it by their editors. That's how strongly they come to feel for the British and French side the more that they see it. This is a page from her diary. As you can see there, she kind of had difficult handwriting to read, but that's another great challenge of the historian, to read that kind of stuff. This ends the first phase of America's involvement with the First World War for the purposes of this lecture. The second happens when she comes back, and then the Lusitania is sunk by the Germans. And we can talk much more about it if anybody is interested. The bottom line is that 128 Americans are killed on a cruise liner that no German sea captain could have mistaken for any other ship. The Lusitania is one of a kind. The question is, how do you want to respond as Americans? The reason the Lusitania appeared as C on my daughter's homework is because the sinking of the Lusitania now raises this question. Now you can't just sit on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and pretend that this won't affect you. Now you have to make a decision. And there are at least three schools of thought. One is the former American President Theodore Roosevelt, who says now is the time to cut diplomatic relations with Germany. Now is the time to internationally define them as an outlaw. And now is the time to start getting ready to send an American army and navy into this war if we have to do it to protect American interests. At the other end of the spectrum is the American Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who says, no, the way to approach this is to ban Americans from traveling into a war zone. The way to keep Americans safe is to keep us as far away from this as we possibly can. Woodrow Wilson is going to try to chart a middle ground, as he's going to try to do for about three years. Make the Germans admit that they did something wrong, but don't risk war. And it appears that his was the most popular course of action in 1915. There's no enthusiasm. If you scan American newspaper editorials, look at members of Congress, look at what even Mary Roberts Reinhardt is saying, there's no enthusiasm for going to war. However, there is every desire for the United States to make a point that Germany can't get away with this. That's what Wilson's trying to do, and that's the original line of debate that starts to get set up. William Jennings Bryan, at the one end, resigned as Secretary of State because he couldn't stomach Wilson's policy. He thought it was too aggressive. On the other end of the spectrum, Theodore Roosevelt and a bunch of his friends in the Republican Party started criticizing Wilson openly for having acted too tamely. Right? Wilson stuck in the middle of this. The Germans also get blamed in the United States for a rash of other things besides the Lusitania. They get blamed for the Armenian Genocide. This is a cartoon from the New York Herald, which shows the New York Tribune, excuse me, which shows Kaiser Wilhelm wearing an Ottoman fez and carrying an Ottoman scimitar, which is dripping with blood. And the caption reads, Alle Mituns, a takeoff on the German belt buckles, Gott Mituns, God is with us. American newspapers argued that the Ottoman Empire would never have been able to massacre that many Ar Armenian Christians without at least the Germans saying that it was OK. Now, we know now that there were many German officers who were thoroughly appalled by what the Ottomans were doing. But what actually happened matters less than what people believe is happening. Right? There was a sabotage campaign here in the United States run by German agents. We know about it, although we've largely forgotten it today. If you go to New York City, to Liberty State Park in New Jersey, that used to be the Black Tom Railway Depot, where all the munitions and all the steel and all the everything made in Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Chicago all came to Jersey City to be shipped overseas. 
In July 1916, while the German army was fighting the Battle of the Somme against the British, where most of those weapons were destined to end up, two German agents blew it up and then managed to get to Mexico before they could find out. Deadliest act of terrorism in American history before 9-11. You can still go to Liberty State Park, beautiful view of Manhattan, but if you go to the back of the park, you can still see the piers where the Germans did this. There was a railway bridge between Vanceboro, Maine and Nova Scotia that the Germans tried to blow up before police caught them. There's a series of these things. There were two German um, officials, one is a naval attache, one's a commercial attache, that Wilson finally had to declare persona non grata and expel them from the United States. One of them is a man by the name of Franz von Papen, who was the last chancellor of Germany before the rise of Adolf Hitler. Right? A major sabotage campaign that's going on. The first year I was here at the War College, I went down to the New York City trip. We went, we all, the whole class goes to New York for a couple of days. And I had the address of the building the Germans ran the spy operation out of. And I thought, well, I'm gonna be in downtown New York. Let's see what it is today. It is the international headquarters of Deutsche Bank today. So there you go. <laughs> the question again is, what should the United States do about this? What should the United States do? And that cartoon I had at the beginning of the dogs, the neutral dogs, now the image that Americans start to use, it's a curious image, is that what the United States ought to do, instead of being a neutral dog, what the United States ought to become is a porcupine, an animal strong enough to defend itself, but of no threat to anybody else. It can't hurt the other animals in the jungle. There are other Americans who are starting to use this phrase of preparedness. They are arguing that the United States has to build what they sometimes call a peace army. Build something strong enough so that the Germans, the French, the British, the Russians, anybody out there has to take the United States seriously. Have a military strong enough that nobody would dare sink a ship that has 128 Americans sitting on it. And this begins this program called preparedness. And for lots of reasons that I'd be happy to talk about in Q&A, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing. The US government is happy to spend money on ships. Navies are easier to spend money on than armies are. The argument can be that they're out there projecting American power and they're protecting the coastlines. If on the other hand, you want to build a very large army, the question that then comes is, what are you going to do with it? And some of you may know some of the things that come out of this. Theodore Roosevelt and his friend General Leonard Wood, a United States Army general, decide that if the United States government isn't going to do this, we'll do it. And they create these things called the Plattsburgh Camps in upstate New York in 1915 and 1916, where young men, most of them college students at elite universities, spend their own money, go up to Plattsburgh, New York, and get yelled at by retired army officers. Voluntarily, they do this. Now again, Theodore Roosevelt doesn't think this is gonna create the basis of a, of a wartime army. What he thinks it will do is shame Woodrow Wilson into doing something about it. The United States Army comes up with a plan called the Continental Army Plan, very famous, at least in its day. The Continental Army Plan begins from the presumption that the United States Army, as currently organized, is a mess. In 1916, the United States Army was basically one central army, the US Army, and 48 state National Guards. Meaning that if the US Army had to go to war, it would technically have 49 commanders in chief, 49 systems of training, 49 standards of weaponry, 49 different ways of doing business. The Secretary of War, a New Jersey Presbyterian minister named William Lindley Garrison, no military experience at all, a progressive reformer, took a look at that and said, that's ridiculous. What we have to do is replace all those National Guards, get rid of all of them, and replace them with one Continental Army of 500,000 men. The initial work is done by the US Army War College on how you would do this. So I have a headline somewhere, I have a slide somewhere with a headline that says, Army War College wants 500,000 man army. Right, just so you know, right? You guys were doing this even then, even 100 years ago. Garrison pitches the plan to Wilson. He probably leaked it to the media as well and 48 governors and most of the House of Representatives lose their minds. Right? You can't have one central army. We want this done through the National Guard. Garrison went to Wilson and said, you gotta do something about this, you're the President of the United States. We can't fight the German army with 49 different systems. Wilson said, I can't support the Continental Army Plan, there isn't enough political support and I'm not putting my political capital behind it. Garrison and his Assistant Secretary of War Henry Breckinridge both resigned in protest in the middle of a presidential election. Right. The result is something called the 1916 National Defense Act, 
which says that the National Guard stays in place but can be federalized in the event of an emergency. It ends the Plattsburgh program in favor of something that becomes called the Reserve Officer Training Corps program to educate young men at the American universities and campuses. And to Garrison's absolute fury, it took the money he wanted for the modernization of the United States Army and gave it to the State National Guards to modernize them. Right? As a result, the United States Army is not prepared for this war when it began in 1917. There's also a very nasty end of this too. Garrison believed if the US Army was gonna to get to 500 or 600,000 men, it had to recruit those men irrespective of race. It had to recruit African Americans and white soldiers and immigrants on an equal basis. This is at a time when only two states in the United States allowed African Americans to serve in their National Guards. Illinois, New York, that's it. New York, New York. Both, <laughs> both in segregated companies, I might add, right? So there is a race that, element to this that Wilson was also unwilling to accept. What happens to me is fascinating. To me, it's absolutely fascinating. When it becomes obvious that preparedness is not gonna do what America needs it to do, when it becomes obvious that there's gonna be a lot of parades but little else, American corporations step in. This is an ad from AT&T. It has, in the semicircle there, Paul Revere making his midnight ride in 1775. And on the right, it has hopefully an Army War College graduate, 1916, in front of a map of the Bell Telephone System. And the ad says, in its wonderful preparedness to inform its citizens of a national need, the United States stands alone and unequaled. It can command the entire Bell Telephone System, which completely covers our country with its network of wires. Individual American companies stepped up. The Pennsylvania Railroad, then the largest corporation in the world, its CEO, said any employee of the Pennsylvania Railroad that wants to take military training, we will guarantee them their job, will continue to pay their salary, and will pay the cost of the training. Right. Thomas Edison formed a committee for American scientific preparedness to get science organized. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic formed a committee of American medical preparedness. It's all done to say to the US government, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you organizing it at the federal level? Right. And my favorite example of all, Columbia University, whose president was a pacifist, sent a memo out to the Columbia University faculty saying the army is organized by G1, G2, G3. Put your name on this form, which of those G things you can help if the country finds itself in a national emergency. And every member of the Columbia faculty put their name on that form. The history department, the history department, led daily calisthenics on the green at Columbia hoping to inspire young men to work out and get in better shape. Right? Believe me, the history department's not the organization you want running that. <laughs> uh, money, of course, plays a role in this. This is a fabulous cartoon I stumbled across almost by accident in Chicago in the Newberry Library. This is from John McCutcheon, who won the first Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning in the United States. This is called Coming Our Way, April 1915. And if you look at it very closely, you'll see the docks of New York City are literally magnets pulling the hard currency of Europe over to the United States. While the bankers in Berlin, in Paris, and London look on exasperated. Americans make an unbelievable amount of money off of the First World War. Both because of the products that the US can sell to the Europeans and because certain products that Americans used to buy in Europe, they now buy in the United States. 1915 and 1916 are the two best years in the history of American Bible sales because American families are no longer buying their Bibles in Europe. The same thing is true of bicycles, pencils, eyeglasses, whatever you can manufacture. Look at the American trade balance. When the war breaks out, we have a net negative trade balance with Europe. Look how fast that changes by December of 1914. There's one study that connects America's attitudes towards the war in 1914 and argues that the only parts of America that are not pro-British and French are the parts of America not getting in on this action. And that is mostly cotton communities in the American South because the British blockade cotton shipments to Germany. And I can talk a little bit more about that if anybody wants. This raises a moral issue for a lot of Americans. Here's Mary Roberts Reinhardt. After Pittsburgh, Westinghouse Corporation signed a major contract. Right? Pittsburgh's trying to get the new Amazon headquarters right now. The rhetoric is similar. 
When America signs that contract, when Pittsburgh signs that contract, Mary Roberts Reinhardt wonders that the, her hometown is fattening on catastrophe. In Nashville, I found a series of lectures, given uh, sermons given by Tennessee ministers. It's a common theme in 1916. What does it say about America if we want Britain and France to win this war, but our role is mostly just to make money? What does that make us? Who are we? Now, of course, some Americans did more than just sit back. This is an ad advertising Serbian Day at the amusement park that I went to growing up, Kennywood Park in Pittsburgh. They still do Serbian Day. Today, it's people of Serbian descent who go and have a day. In 1916, it meant that all profits from Kennywood on that day went to the relief of Serbia. Americans gave enormous amounts of money. My colleague Julia Irwin at the University of South Florida estimates that one in three Americans gave money in the First World War. And 95% of that money goes to three countries, France, Belgium, and Serbia, all members of the Allies. John Wanamaker, the great Philadelphia industrialist, raised $100 million for Belgium alone. Philadelphia raised enough money in three hours to fund two entire field hospitals for the French army. Right? Enormous amounts of money that are going from the United States to Europe, and they are going almost exclusively to the Allies. Some people were willing to put their lives on the line. Delwyn Starr, one of the great American football heroes, a Harvard star in 1916, killed on the Western Front fighting in the British Army. These men are members of an American air squadron, the Lafayette Escadrille. Another Pittsburgh guy, Billy Thaw, that's him right there, son of one of the executives of the Pennsylvania Railroad, got the idea. What we'll do is we Americans will volunteer to fly in a squadron for the French Air Force. We all, most of them had their own planes. Billy Thaw's the first private pilot's license in the United States. Flew an airplane underneath the Brooklyn Bridge in 1912. Right. These guys get together and they form a volunteer air squadron for the French Army. Theodore Roosevelt, Cornelius Vanderbilt love it so much that they write checks to these guys and tell them, here's some money, do whatever you want with it. So they throw lavish parties. They have whiskey and soda, two lion cubs, as their mascots. Everybody who's anybody comes to a Lafayette Escadrille party. I think this is the origin of the American fighter pilot culture. I mean this. I mean this sincerely. The American army doesn't want to discipline or cannot discipline these guys. The French army doesn't want to. As long as the combat record is great, which it is, the PR record is unbelievable. The PR value is incredible. Why do anything to discipline them? The, the nice side note of this is when the United States got involved in the war, the U.S. Army rejected many of these guys on health grounds and wouldn't let them fly. So they stayed inside the French Army. Okay. So a lot of Americans, as you know, some very famous people are over there. J.P. Morgan's daughter, Anne Morgan, is over there. She builds a chateau, rebuilds a chateau for the care of women, or orphans and widows. It's still there. It's now the museum at Blarencourt dedicated to Franco-American friendship. Ernest Hemingway goes over there, as you know, as an ambulance driver, first in Italy, later in other places as well. There are Americans fighting in the armies of the British and the French. There's a new study out of Canada that estimates that as many as 70,000, 70,000 members of the Canadian Army might have been Americans. The easiest way to join the British Army is to walk across the border in Canada, claim that you were born in Ontario, and put your name and sign the thing. Right? There's a research team in Canada that's actually going back and finding the birth certificates of these guys. 70,000, they estimate, were in fact born in the United States. The French consulate in New Orleans opens up an office specifically for Americans who want to fight for France. Right? At first, the U.S. government threatens to take away citizenship and all this stuff. Right? Then they realize they can't do it. They can't stop it. So I've explained to you why the United States is sympathetic to the Allies. What I haven't yet done is explain why we enter the war. And that's what I'd like to do in the 15 minutes or so that is left and then I'll be happy to take your, your questions. Sometimes when you're doing research, you come across something and it just stops you in your tracks. This is it. This is the cover of Life Magazine on February 10th, 1916. I'd like you to note the date, please. February 10th, 1916. This is early on. I hope it's not too hard to see in the back there. The, uh, the publisher of my book would not let me use this image as the cover image because they said it was too busy. Right? I think it's actually beautiful. This is the cover of the, of the magazine. Most of the United States is labeled as New Prussia. Von Papen and Boyed City, the two diplomats that Wilson had expelled, get cities named for them out in the west. Um, New Berlin is right there. Krupsburg, Schlaughterhouse, 
Florida is Turconia. The West Coast is Japonica. Baja California is Austriana. My personal favorite. I'll explain this in just a minute. I don't think this is a reference to Canadians. I don't think this is a reference to Canadians. They're generally lovely people. I don't think that's what this is. The province of Mexico with Wilhelmsburg as its capital. Okay. This is a fear that is running through American culture in early 1916, and here's what it is. By doing nothing, the United States can put itself in an absolutely untenable strategic position. Let's say, in 1916, the Germans put enough pressure on the British and French that it looks like they can win the war. One way Britain and France can get out of that dilemma is by doing what the Europeans have always done with the Americas. They can trade parts of their American empire for gains in Europe. That's how this part of the world went from being French to being English. Okay. Here's the fear. It is not that the, barbarians are, that the Canadians are barbarians. The fear is that the British might give to the Germans, in order to get out of the war, the base at Esquimalt out here, Halifax out here, maybe Toronto right there. The French have two bases, two islands up here, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. They also have possessions in the Caribbean, as do the British. The Panama Canal opened in 1914. The fear that Americans have is, one, that the British and French might sacrifice all of this stuff in order to give, it, give them a way out of the war in, in the East, in the Europe, excuse me. That's one fear. It's for this reason that in 1916, the United States bought the Danish Virgin Islands from Denmark and renamed them the United States Virgin Islands. The fear was that Germany would invade Denmark, or blackmail Denmark, and take the Virgin Islands and create a base right there. From his retirement, William Jennings Bryan proposed buying Canada from the British. The British need money. We don't want them to give Canada to the Germans. Give them $100 million for Canada. It's a safe, secure investment. It'll protect our northern flank. Right. This is the fear that's running around. You can see here my favorite. There's a little American reservation right there with Goose Step as its capital. Right. There are also fears in the American body politic that what Germany might do is try to ally with Japan and Mexico in an anti-American alliance. And all of this could happen because the United States did not prepare. Right? On my bookshelf at home is a wonderful teen fiction book. It's The Red Dawn of 1916 called The Defense of Pittsburgh. It's one of three books, The Defense of Washington, Defense of Pittsburgh, Defense of Cincinnati, aimed at a teenaged audience. And at the end of the book, when they're holding down the line in Cincinnati, one teenager says to the other, at least we know that we didn't start this war. And the other teenager says, yes, we did because we weren't prepared, right? They're preparedness arguments, right? Again, I don't think most Americans were afraid that the Germans were gonna come marching down St. Louis, but this kind of a scenario where Halifax, Esquimalt, Martinique, with Mexico joining the Germans, doesn't look quite so far-fetched. Ryan's here from New Zealand. New Zealand sends the highest proportion of people to the Western Front with no conscription, something like 17% of eligible men. The new theory in New Zealand is the reason that is, is not because New Zealanders really cared so much about England. They knew that if Germany won the war, New Zealand could become a German colony. They're not fighting for London, which is thousands of miles away. They're fighting for their own communities. Now you could, quite reasonably in America, look at somebody who believed this stuff and say, you're out of your mind. You could reasonably do that. Then things like this start happening. Pancho Villa raids New Mexico. He brought along with him an American woman named Maud Hawks, who he then released. Maud Hawks, when she was interviewed by American newspapers, said, quote, Villa bragged about his plans to kill everybody in the United States and said that he would be helped by the Germans and the Japanese. James Garrard, the American ambassador in Germany, reported back to the United States, quote, most Germans think that America's Mexico troubles are to their advantage. I am sure that Pancho Villa's attacks are made in Germany. Every night, 50 million Germans cry themselves to sleep because Mexico has not risen against us. Right? A belief that all of these things are linked together. Right? And the Americans know for sure, for a fact, that those German spies who committed the Sabotage Act in New Jersey, who committed the Sabotage Act in New Brunswick, they, they end up in Mexico. 
Right? Mexico is then what we would today call a failed state going through a revolution. The Germans have picked a different side than the United States has picked. Right? It's starting to look like this stuff isn't quite so far-fetched. Then things start to accelerate. In late February of 1917, Great Britain intercepted this document, the so-called Zimmerman telegram. It's a very famous story. There's a great story behind it, the technical details of it. It's a wonderful story. What's important about it is what it says. It says, we intend, we the Germans, intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. You will inform the president of Mexico of the above as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States is certain and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and Germany. Now, that document seems quite clearly to prove this. Right? Very famously, Zimmerman's at a press conference in Berlin. Hey, the Americans and British claim they have this telegram that says that you're going to do an alliance with Mexico and Japan aimed at the United States and that you're going to take away three states from the United States and give it to Mexico. You didn't write that, did you? And Zimmerman says, yeah, I did. I did. They got me. There's no point denying it. They have it. Right? Three events that happen back to back to back. Germans announce unrestricted submarine warfare, which leads the United States to break diplomatic relations. The revelation of the Zimmerman telegram, which is by far the most important of the three events. And then the revolution in Russia, which occurred, the first revolution in Russia, which occurs at roughly the same time, late February, early March, which takes the Tsar out. It doesn't yet put the communists in. It puts in place a government by, name, by a man named Alexander Kerensky. This allows Wilson and most Americans, most Americans, to argue that maybe this war will destroy autocratic governments and leave Europe a society only of democracies. And if that happens, then maybe this war actually is worth fighting. Maybe something positive will come out. Even many German Americans make this argument. They're all non-Prussians, or mostly non-Prussians. They're Bavarians. They're Württembergers. They're Hanoverians. Their argument is, if this is a war that will take the Prussian government out and give Germany a representative democracy, then there's no conflict between America's goals and Germany's goals. Right? These are men like John Pershing, Dwight Eisenhower, Eddie Rickenbacker, all of whom are German-Americans. All of whom are German-Americans. All right, why do I think this matters? I think it matters for a couple of reasons. One, we have misunderstood why the United States went to war in 1917. I would argue, I did argue, the American people believe that they're going to war to prevent that Life magazine map that I showed you earlier. They're going to war to prevent this. This war is for the United States not about Belgium. It is not about the security of France, although those are nice to-haves. It is about protecting the threat, protecting against the threat that is made to the United States. It is about the threat to America's borders. This is why, when President Wilson entered the First World War, he was careful to say that we are not a member of the alliance. We are an associated power to that alliance, because our goals are not their goals. It is also why, as I'll show you in just a bit, when the war ends, the, when the American people think that the war ends, much earlier than do the Europeans, much differently than do the Europeans. What the Americans want is an end to the threat. What the Americans want is an end to the possibility that by having done nothing, they can find themselves in a much worse position than when they went in. Last slide. War over with that great German with his hands up. What I'd like you to note, and I know you can't see it from back there, is the date on this. This is the New York Evening World, November 7th, 1918. November 7th, 1918. Nothing's been signed yet. All that happened on November 7th is that the news broke in the West that the Germans had asked for an armistice. That's it. To the Americans, that means the war is over. And if the war is over, that means the United States should start demobilizing its army and start bringing our boys back home, our sons, our husbands, our lovers, our brothers, whatever, and bring them back home. 
This is why we commemorate the end of the First World War on November 11th, 1918, the date that the armistice gets signed. But the armistice didn't end anything. The war doesn't end until the peace conference, the Paris Peace Conference, produces the Treaty of Versailles on June 28th, 1919, one of five treaties that it produces. Right? For my view, the way I think of this, the image that I've been using, when the First World War broke out, it's like an hourglass. There's a lot of diversity of opinion in the United States in 1914 about what the United States ought to do. By the spring of 1917, all of those options have gone away except belligerent, belligerence. That doesn't mean the American people were enthusiastic about going to war. It means that they understood that they had just one choice remaining. Then, starting on November 7th, four days before the armistice in 1911, now they start diverging again about what they ought to do in the post-war period. That's why the fight over the Treaty of Versailles is as bitter as it is in the United States. And as most of you know, that's a treaty that the United States never did sign. The United States Senate never did ratify. Right? What the Americans agree on is ending this nightmare. What they do not agree on is what ought to come next. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions, don't we? Scott, yeah. Could you please use a microphone? <laughs> Who said that? The voice of that. Yeah, you said uh, previously that almost exclusively the investment and in American money were going to the Allies. What percentage of the investment from the U.S. was going to support Germany? So we think it's a little hard to tell. We think it's less than 10. We think it's about 8. And the reason I say that it's hard to tell is that what the Germans were doing is using the neutral states on their border, Holland, Norway, Denmark, to try to disguise some of that trade that's coming through. So what the British did, and the United States kind of followed its lead, the British Board of Trade did, they actually had these very sophisticated economic models. If Holland took in 10,000 tons of coal in 1905, and now they're taking in 12,000 tons of coal, the presumption is those extra 2,000 are actually intended for Germany. Right? So the British blockade of Holland, of a neutral state, blockades anything above what the British estimate they had in the last line of data extrapolated out. We think the number's around 8%. What that tells me is that America's money and its sympathies are actually headed in the same direction. Any other questions? Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Well, that's Jim, that's not sir. Hey, Hi, Mike, Jim, Jim DeCrocco. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, question I've got about this map. It's very, very interesting. And you mentioned uh, California and the West Coast essentially being, according to Life magazine, being occupied by Japan. Now, I know that Japan was an ally in uh, World War I, so why, uh, why would they have this? They're not an ally of the United States. They're an ally of Great Britain, which is a very important distinction. When this map is being done, the United States is neutral. The United States has no relationship with Japan. What I think is happening here, it is a reflection, of course, of the West Coast's own anti-Asian racism. This is the era of the Chinese Exclusion Act, when Chinese weren't allowed to come to the US or buy property. This is the era of the so-called Gentleman's Agreement, which is negotiated, renegotiated, by the American Secretary of State in 1915, by which the Japanese will prevent Japanese from leaving Japan to come to the United States, so the US doesn't have to exclude them the way they excluded the Chinese. So I would be careful with the distributive property that the US is allied to Britain, Britain is allied to Japan, therefore the US is allied to Japan. That's not the case, right? And many Americans are already talking in 1915, 1916 about a post-war world in which Japan emerges as the greatest threat to the United States. Billy Mitchell believed this that that's what's going to come out of this. Japan will be the problem. So be careful. What else is on your mind? Yes, sir. Hey, sir, Brian Kirk. So along the lines that you just spoke about, was the feelings toward Japan tied to the sort of the domestic terrorism you started off with and the leadership that remained in power late going into World War II, was that sort of what led to some of yeah. the internment of Japanese Americans and things? Did we learn the wrong lesson from the domestic terrorism? You know, in World War I, were those things connected? So there's never any allegation against Japanese living in the United States of domestic terrorism. There's never any allegation. Um, the interesting point you're raising, of course, in my view, and anybody that's had me in class for five seconds probably has heard me say this, to me, it's the same war. It's a 30 years war, right? With anti-Asian racism being a dimension of American policy. Not the only one, certainly, but a dimension. So you may know, Japanese Americans in Hawaii are never put under internment. Right, where you would think the threat would be greatest. They're put under internment in Oregon, Japan, in Washington, California, places where there's an economic incentive to inter them and where the anti-Asian bias is deepest. 
So I don't know that you can draw a direct line between the specific events of World War I, though there are some specific tensions between the US and Japan at the end of World War I, uh, but you can see a consistent thread of anti-Asian policy that's running through that is accumulating here. We talked at least in a couple of the TWS seminars about enabling factors, right? That wars enable certain conditions to happen that don't happen in others. This is an enabling condition. World War II is an enabling condition. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, how, would you, uh, how would you classify the German escalation of the uh, submarine warfare? Uh, effect on Wilson entering the war? So it, it, it goes in kind of waves. So the German decision in February 1917 to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, Wilson gives a, very, gives a speech in Philadelphia, which he gets blasted for, in which he says, look, I know what the Germans have said, but I'm going to await their overt act. In other words, I don't believe they're actually going to sink anything. And then the Germans keep sinking ships. And Wilson has to, it's, it's like the Obama red line comment in a way, right? He gets criticized, well, you said this, now what are you going to do? Right? There's a very famous American reporter named Floyd Gibbons who's actually on one of the ships that gets torpedoed, the Laconia, and he's in a lifeboat, and a British guy rows up to him, knows who he is, rows up to him and says, hey, is this your president's bleeding overt act or not? Like, what are you guys doing about this? Right? And Gibbons looks at him. Gibbons fully wants the United States involved in this war now, and Gibbons says, I, I don't have any idea what the president will do. He's a weak character, and I don't know what he'll do. Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, says the same thing. Like, how many overt acts is he going to wait for? So in my view, Wilson is hoping beyond hope for some deus ex machina. He's hoping for some solution that will fall down from the skies and solve this problem for him. I don't think he's pushing the United States into this war at all. I think he's looking for whatever he can find. His own son-in-law and another member of the American cabinet uh, come to him and say, if you don't go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war, they're going to ask, they're going to pass one without you. And if that happens, your presidency is done. You have to do this. So he's, he's still hoping that there's a way out of this. What that's going to be, nobody knows. Angus, you had your hand down. Let's get the British perspective in here. Uh, that's very kind, Michael. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, actually, about the, uh, the, the impact socially back in, in the U.S., given the number of European uh, immigrants that were in the U.S. at that time, and given the fact that the, the U.S. entered the war not long after um, the uprising, uh, the Easter uprising uh, right. in Ireland and, and right. sort of Irish sympathies, what sort of impact did, did, the, did that dynamic in the U.S. have on decisions to enter the war? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a big topic, so I didn't want to put it into this lecture. There's a whole chapter in the book if anybody's really interested. I look at three groups in particular, German Americans, Jewish Americans, and Irish Americans, all of whom are at strongly neutral or even pro-central powers when the war begins. What I argue is, for reasons both because they're Americans and because of their ethnic identity, that view changes to a pro-allied one. So let me take the Irish one since you mentioned it. Easter Rising is when the Germans encourage the Easter rebels to rise up against the British government. The British come in and put it down with incredible viciousness so that even American Anglophiles are opposed to British policy. What happens in the Irish American community is that they, they, they actually come to the, the, the logical flow this way. Germany is not going to help Ireland become independent. They showed that by their ham-fisted nature in the rising. The only way that Ireland gets something out of this, the only way, is if the United States wins, Britain wins the war with the United States having a dominating voice in the post-war peace. If Wilson really believes what he says about national self-determination, then if the Allies win, with the Americans having a dominant seat at the peace table, Wilson can enforce national self-determination over the British, which will then be okay for Ireland. So what I argue in the book, the same thing happens for Jews, I argue, and Italians too, since Stefano's here, that, right, what happens is Italian Americans, Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, their identities both as ethnics, quote unquote, and as Americans, come into alignment. Now, what Irish American leaders didn't know is that Woodrow Wilson has decided that the Irish aren't a nation since they're represented through a democratic Great Britain, right? But they don't know that yet. So something similar happens. Italy enters World War I at almost the same time as the Lusitania sinking, right? So that there's no contradiction now between Italian American identity and a pro-war or pro-intervention standpoint. So I actually looked into the papers. Philadelphia used to have these, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, they all used to have these enormous, um, uh, fraternal orders, where you know Italians arriving from Ischia or Capri, they could find food and networks in America. When Italy enters World War I, they all change their mission so that the 150,000 Italians living in the United States with military papers can get back to fight for Italy. Right? There's no contradiction in those two things anymore, right? which there had been at the beginning. So I could talk much more about this. You probably don't want me to. It's in the book. 
But what I argue is, again, that all of those things are coming into alignment in the same direction. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, Michael, what, what were the Mexicans saying uh, with respect to diplomacy around the, the telegram and, yeah. and the revelation from that? So the, the, officially, the Mexican government comes out and says, we renounced this telegram. We don't want anything to do with it. We didn't write this. We didn't even mean to get it. Like, we don't, we don't want anything to do with this at all. Um, in reality, what they're hoping is that the United States will be tied down by a war in Europe, though they don't want to do anything to actually cause that. Because there's been this civil war in Mexico. As I hope you all know, the United States sent troops in several occasions, Veracruz, a lot of the Marines who win Medals of Honor at Bella Wood had also won Medals of Honor in Mexico. Um, so they are kind of hoping that this will take Wilson's mind away from Mexico, which it does. But they don't want to be an active agent in that. Um, Wilson's the guy who famously said, I'm going to teach the Mexicans to elect good men. And the Mexicans would just assume that he stay away. It's about the same time Porfirio Diaz, the Mexican president, one of my favorite quotations from history, he said, Mexico, a, a poor Mexico so far from God, so close to the United States. So technically, they're trying to stay out of it. I think we have time for maybe one or two, and then I'm happy to stick around a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, great presentation. Um, as far as 100 years, we're 100 years past this. Uh, are there any inferences, lessons that we can apply from 100 years ago to our national uh, security posture today? Yeah, so I don't want to draw these too tight because every historical time period is, it's, is distinct. But it seems to me pretty clear that the American people will rally and support a war if they understand the way it affects their national interests, if they understand the way that it affects their home communities. It seems to me it's much more difficult to ask Americans to engage in broad, global reform projects that are disconnected from those interests. I think this helps to explain the difference in reaction to the 2001 operations in Afghanistan and the 2003 invasion in Iraq, just to cite one example, or Korea-Vietnam, if you want to draw that analogy. I think that's one, and I personally believe as an historian, this is a, a deeply held belief of mine as an historian, if you try to understand these periods of, of war and periods of conflict by going top down, by starting with the elites and then trying to figure out the rest, you're going to completely miss the point. The way to understand what's happening in American society and the way to predict what will happen next on the basis of the thesis is, in fact, to look bottom up and look at what's happening inside American communities as they're beginning to influence their leaders. So I would, I would go with those two takeaways. Uh, you could do geopolitically, too, the danger of alliances, the dangers of overcommitment to alliances, the dangers of imbalances, all of that stuff. But I think for the American case, these are the two that, I would, that I've been telling people when people ask me that question, that's been my answer. One last one, maybe? Anybody got anything else? Yes, ma'am. Sir, could you further develop the two camps that were at the Treaty of Versailles for the American perspective? Quickly, uh, they are two, uh, and they are still well alive in America. Uh, there is a group that believes that America will operate best as part of international organizations that America will have a large voice in if we don't necessarily dominate them. So that something like the World Trade Organization, what becomes, of course, the United Nations, these are in America's best interest because it allows America to interact with the world on terms favorable to the United States. There's another group. In 1919, they called themselves isolationists, though the term is a little bit misleading, who argued that American interests are best served, since we are a great power, by operating as independently as possible. So the isolationist arguments against the League of Nations are in part because under the League of Nations, the US and, say, Ecuador, no offense to Ecuador, get the same vote. That's one reason that, that the League of Nations is so controversial. The UN is not controversial because the US gets a veto power in it. So the debate ideologically is really those people who believe that America should encourage the growth of international multilateral institutions, and those people who believe that America functions best when it's left alone. That's essentially the, the, the core of the debate. Wilson obviously wants more international organizations with US participation. The chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Cabot Lodge, actually believes that most of those organizations are unconstitutional because it gives powers that belong to the US Congress to an international body. Therefore, they're unconstitutional. Therefore, he won't even take the Treaty of Versailles forward to be voted on. In my own view, that debate is one, of course, that we're still having. Right? How should the United States interact with international organizations? Should we interact with international organizations? And what's the best way to guarantee American security and prosperity? And that's a debate that really begins in earnest in 1918, 1919.
So once again, welcome to Carlisle. I'll be around for a little bit if anybody has any other questions, but I know you're due back up in seminar. So thanks a lot.